You're listening to the micro version of the Savage Lovecast, www.savagelovecast.com. If you're stuck in a relationship quandary, or if you're looking for sexual harmony, well, there's nothing you can't ask on the Savage Lovecast. There's something I want to say about a billionaire at the top of this week's show, but it's probably not the billionaire you're thinking about. But before we get to the billionaire I'm thinking about, or the billionaires I'm thinking about, billionaires whose behavior really should be scandalizing us, I want to say this about Jeff Bezos' badass, dom-top, big dick energy move last week. For those of you just tuning in, some incredibly boring text messages that Bezos and his girlfriend sent to each other were made public a few weeks ago, made public by the National Enquirer, or the, quote, paper of record, as Donald Trump probably describes it. And these text messages, which were universally described as steamy, were supposed to shock and appall us all because, now if there are children in the room or in the car, you might want to turn the volume down, we were supposed to be shocked because Jeff Bezos liked how his lover smelled and he wanted to hold her. Mmm, kinky. The release of these steamy text messages prompted Bezos and his wife, who were already separated, to announce their divorce. Well, it turns out the National Enquirer doesn't just have Bezos' text messages. They've also got pictures that Bezos sent his girlfriend, including dick pics, and pics his girlfriend sent to him. Swapping text messages, dirty text messages, and photos, including dirty photos. Billionaires! They're just like us! Just like the overwhelming majority of us, more than 80% of us who are, according to studies done at Drexel University, using our phones to flirt. We send steamy text messages and explicit photos to our spouses, to our pieces on the side, and sometimes to complete strangers. We found out about Bezos' dirty pics, not from the National Enquirer, though, but from Bezos himself. The National Enquirer was threatening to release the photos if Bezos didn't announce that the National Enquirer was not, quote, politically motivated or influenced by political forces when it had published his text messages. The National Enquirer wanted Bezos to say that they weren't carrying water for Donald Trump, or they would, the implied threat was, release these photographs. Bezos opted instead to announce to the world that the National Enquirer has his dick pics, which were described in detail in an email Bezos quoted in his post, and that he wasn't going to give in to this kind of blackmail. I actually took some time this weekend out of my own busy sex messaging and dirty pics swapping schedule to write something for the New York Times encouraging Bezos to release those dick pics himself. If you're a regular Lovecast listener, even an irregular one, I didn't say anything in the New York Times that you haven't heard me say here. We live in a world where two things are true. Almost everyone has a few nude photographs out there somewhere, saved on a stranger's phone, archived on a dating app you forgot you signed up for, lingering on some tech company server somewhere, and yet a single dirty pic has the power to end someone's career. It's a firing offense. It's blackmail material. So it's always seemed to me that... The sooner we all have a few dirty pics out there, the sooner it won't matter whose dirty pics get out there. I've always thought there should be a day, an annual release a nude pic day. Imagine a kind of purge where we all release a few dirty pics of our own, nobody else's, thus depriving hackers, vengeful exes, unscrupulous publishers, sexphobic employers, and former KGB agents of the power to destroy people's lives or their countries. If Jeff Bezos goes first, I think we should call the annual Release a Nude Pick Day event Jeff Bezos Day. It would be a better legacy, Jeff, than, you know, the destruction of brick-and-mortar retail, putting unionized grocery store checkout clerks out of work, and Amazon stealing tips from delivery drivers. Oh, shit. Ah, I'm almost out of time, and I haven't talked about the billionaires whose behavior we really ought to be scandalized by and ought to be talking about. The Sacklers. A Sackler? Sounds like someone we might have talked about on the show before. Sackler, Sackling, sounds vaguely euphemism-y. Suckling, of course, as everyone knows, is a particular kind of sucking. And some people like to suck nut sacks. Some people are teabagging bottoms. And if you told me that people who like to suck sacks are called Sacklers, Sucklers of Sacks, and if you told me there were, until a few weeks ago, porn Tumblr blogs where Sacklers gathered to share their Sackling porn, I totally would have believed you and not been able to check your claims since Tumblr deleted 12.5 million porn blogs late last year and coulda, woulda, shoulda, I guess, also deleted all the Sackling Sackler porn blogs that might have been out there. 
oh, the world would be a better place if the Sacklers were a community of dedicated ball washers. Nope. The actual Sacklers own Purdue Pharma, the drug company that makes OxyContin, the highly addictive opioid that was rolled out in 1996 and marketed as safe and non-addictive. And this misrepresentation, combined with a big push to convince doctors to overprescribe Oxy, led directly to the opioid epidemic. Members of the Sackler family made billions and continue to make billions off Oxy. As a lawsuit making its way through the courts in Massachusetts reveals, the Sacklers were personally involved in pushing misleading claims to the public about the addictiveness of OxyContin. Quote, since OxyContin came on the market in 1996, more than 200,000 people have died in the United States from overdoses involving prescription opioids, the New York Times reports. And Richard Sackler, quote, urged that sales representatives advise doctors to prescribe the highest dosage of the powerful opioid painkiller because it was the most profitable. He also urged his PR flax to blame addicts for becoming addicted to OxyContin. The opioid epidemic now kills 100 Americans every day. The National Safety Council announced last month that Americans are more likely to die from opioid overdoses now than from car crashes. Other people's sex lives are inherently interesting. Welcome to the Savage Lovecast, where we discuss every week other people's sex lives. And dick pics are wonderful when they're solicited. Unsolicited dick pics, not so wonderful. But if we want to be scandalized by the actions of a billionaire... Well, it seems to me that the actions of a whole family of billionaires who profited handsomely off the deaths of hundreds of thousands of Americans should get at least as much press and at least as many skits on Saturday Night Live as that one billionaire who sent his girlfriend that one dick pic. All right, coming up on today's show on the micro free edition of the Savage Lovecast, tons of your cues, lots of my A's, and on the Magnum edition of the show, which you can subscribe to at savagelovecast.com, I chat with Eric Loya from the Free Speech Coalition about the growing problem of sex censorship on the internet. Maybe we'll get to the deletion of all those Sackler porn blogs. And we got along so well that he stayed on to help me answer a few of your calls. And again, of course, on the micro, so many calls and conversations with you, my perverted listeners. This episode of the Savage Lovecast is brought to you by Everlane, luxury basic clothing and accessories made at ethical factories without those retail markups. For free shipping and to support the Lovecast, go to everlane.com slash savage. This episode of the Savage Lovecast is brought to you by Bull and Branch, luxury, affordable, fair trade certified sheets. Get 50 bucks off a set of sheets plus free shipping by going to bullandbranch.com and entering savage. This episode of the Savage Lovecast is brought to you by AdamandEve.com. Get 50% off one item and free shipping when you enter the offer code SAVAGE at checkout. Hey, Dan. I have a question about my partner and my relationship. We have a really open relationship. We talk about money and sexual desires, everything. Else. But I've never disclosed how much money I make. And I know that I make about twice as much as he does. Um, recently, upon a raise that I felt was not adequate, I to him about it, and I did tell him how much I made. The face that he made when he found out how much I made um, was shocking, and he just looked like a I shot his puppy dog. He said, wow, I can't imagine making that much. And I started thinking how guilty I feel that we split all the bills and maybe I buy a little more groceries or more expensive steaks. But I'm wondering if I should be paying more um, of our costs. We're not married, um, but we've been together a long time. And I'm kind of dealing with this crushing guilt now. There's a large body of research out there that shows that when women make more than their male partners, when women make more than their husbands, that it can destabilize the relationship, even if people are liberal and progressive and consider themselves feminists, even if they're Democrats and progressives, a lot of us are really tied into these gendered expectations uh, about power in a relationship. And the gendered expectation, the default setting is that the man should have more power. And even people who are feminists, even a lot of women who consider themselves feminists are consciously, in some cases, or subconsciously, hopefully in many, many more cases, tied into that, invested in that, if I may use the word, invested in that paradoxically. 
So what you described can be a problem. And I'm curious, and if you'd included your phone number, I would have wanted to call you and actually get your boyfriend on the phone, about that look on his face when you told him that you make so much more money than he does. And he said, I could never imagine even making that much money. You seem to have interpreted the look on his face to mean he may feel that he's been getting a raw deal because you make so much more than he does and you've been together a long time and you've been splitting expenses 50 50 and yet you are partners you live together you're not married you haven't merged your finances obviously but you're partners in this and he as a percentage of his income is bearing a disproportionate weight of your shared expenses rent utilities other things even if you're popping for the filet mignon every once in a while and is that why he had that look on his face did he feel cheated or did he have that look on his face because some gendered shit some sexist shit rose up in his soul that made him feel emasculated that this isn't the way it's supposed to work did he feel as if his power which he'd never really maybe even thought about or examined because he knew you had an income and he had an income and he'd never paused to consider the possibility that given your job you might be making more money than he does but in that moment when that was laid before him did he feel emasculated and is that feeling of emasculation which is a problem in a lot of other people's relationships, a lot of opposite sex folks relationships when it comes to who makes more money. And if it's her, it's a problem. Is it going to become a problem in your relationship? Or is it just about simple fairness and how long you've been together and reassessing how you're going to split those finances? Because it seems to me, and I'm a big supporter of taxing the rich. I'm a big supporter of people who make more money bearing more of the expense of running a society. I'm a big supporter of if you're partners and not roommates, roommates split expenses 50 50. But if you're partners, if you're long term romantic partners, and you're not going to pool your money, the person who makes more should pay more. The person who makes more should dedicate the same rough percentage of their income to the household and maintaining it and running it for the benefit of both that the person who makes less income dedicates to the household and running it. So if you make twice as much money as he does, maybe you pay a larger percentage of the rent. If you make four times as much money than he does, maybe he pays 25% of the rent and you pay 75% of the rent. So you're both bearing, not in real dollars, but in percentage of income, the weight of the expense of running the household where you both live in this romantic partnership where you're sharing everything. And you say you're not married. You don't say you have a problem with that. You don't say you necessarily want to get married. I'm not telling you you have to get married. But most married people do merge their finances and then everything goes into a shared pot and the money is drawn out to cover expenses and to cover stakes. And that can be another conversation you can have. You didn't say that you necessarily wanted to get married, but if you've wanted to get married and he hasn't wanted to get married... You can make marriage your condition for merging finances and moving out of the 50-50 roommate split that you two have been doing for however long you've been together uh, to merged shared finances and everybody pouring the money into the same account and all of the expenses being drawn from that same account. Hey, Dan, I'm a huge fan of your show. and I've been listening for a little while now. I want to thank you for being one of my few heroes in life. I am a gay cisgendered male and simple question. Um, I very much enjoy giving blowjobs and I do it with most of my partners. But the weird thing is, is that I get a super runny nose every time I suck dick. Um, no matter when it is, I just run and run and run and I have to go and blow my nose out periodically. Um, usually the guy is pretty you know, considerate of that issue and just lets me go and blow my nose. But I would like to know um, why, why is my nose always running when I'm giving a blow job and what can I do to perhaps prevent that blow job runny nose problem? I hope you're sitting down. Erectile tissues, we all know where those are. You have erectile tissues in your junk, not just dudes. Women also have erectile tissues. Erectile chambers, part of the clitoris. When we are aroused, those erectile tissues fill with blood. You have erectile tissue also around your nipples. A lot of people. You have erectile tissue. All people, what am I saying? You also have erectile tissue in your nasal passages. That for some people, when they become aroused, their nasal passages, their nose, the erectile tissues in their sinuses, their nose, also fill with blood and begin secreting 
I guess the nose equivalent of pre-cum. And so what's happening with you at that moment that you're giving that blow job, uh, yeah, it's kicking all of your salivary, everything into gear. It's also kicking your nasal passes, the rectal tissues in your nose into gear. And they are pumping out a little bit of lubricant too. And it not necessarily a problem. Now, some people, when it comes to pre-cum, pump out a lot. It's not pumped out by the erectile tissues, but it's a part of a confluence of physiological responses and call outs and it all works together. Same thing in the nose. Uh, and so when you're aroused, when you're giving that blow job, nose kicks into gear. What can you do about it? Well, you can hack it back and incorporate all that additional lubrication into your blow job. A cum towel, the cum towels you keep by the side of the bed for the loads that get blown also can be by the side of the bed for the nose that needs mid blow job to get blown once or twice. Since you know this is a thing, since you know that your nose kicks in and you produce a lot of snot during a blow job, you shouldn't be getting up and running to the bathroom for a tissue. You should come prepared. Be prepared. That's the Boy Scouts marching song. Be prepared. That should be your blow job marching orders. Put those tissues by the side of the bed, put that cum towel on the nightstand. And you can deftly incorporate a few blown noses into the blowjob without having to run out of the room. Free stuff is the best, but free stuff that will ignite your Valentine's Day is even better. When you go to adamandeve.com and select almost any one item, you will get it at 50% off. That's amazing by itself, but here's where they load on the free stuff. When you enter my exclusive code at checkout, Savage, not only do you get 50% off that one item, you also get 10 tantalizing free items. First, for your viewing pleasure, six free movies. Next, a free mystery pack that includes an item for men, a special toy for women, and something for anyone, plus free shipping. Now, that's a lot of free Valentine's Day stuff. So head on over to adamandeve.com and be sure to use offer code SAVAGE. Again, that's S-A-V-A-G-E, SAVAGE, for 50% off nearly any item and a whole pile of free Valentine's Day stuff. That's SAVAGE at adamandeve.com. Hi, Dan. So kind of a funny story. I have been on FetLife for... Um, a couple of years now, but nothing's ever panned out from it. Um, I started seeing a guy recently that we just kind of met in person, and we've been hooking up and hanging out. Really, really positive, good relationship. And I noticed that somebody had messaged me on FetLife, and I recognize that it's this guy that I'm hooking up with. I'm not upset at all. We're not in like a, you know, any sort of monogamous, monogamous relationship, but I don't know how to bring it up. I feel like it's like that Pina Colada song and like we both kind of found each other. Um, our profiles are crazy the way that they mesh. It's almost like, hey, I'm looking for you and you're looking for me. Um, and I just don't know how to go about it. I'm actually really excited because I thought the sex was semi um, vanilla, and although he talked about kind of getting freaky, like I haven't seen it yet. So I've been wanting to bring it up to him anyway. So I'm just kind of curious, maybe if it would just be too weird to tell him that it's, you know, me, or maybe I send him back a picture so he can tell it's me. Yeah, I would love your advice. So this is the kinky pina colada song. It is. It's it is. That's exactly all I could think of. And that's all I've been thinking of every time we hang out since. I'm like biting my tongue off. It's crazy. <laughs> biting your tongue off, not my kink, but your kink is okay, even if it's not mine. Um, <laughs> why haven't you just written him a note? Uh, like this is, this is a, a Yahtzee moment. You win. This is a good <laughs> problem to have. You're having good vanilla sex with this person. You've established a rapport. There's intimacy. Uh, and you discovered by chance, by accident, by kismet that you're a kink match too. I, yes, I know. I'm just really nervous about um, how to approach it. I guess I just don't want to embarrass him. And I know that's just silly. How, how would you approach someone if you, if you had to tell them that they had a winning lottery ticket? Like, 
Uh, unless he's uh, unless he's one of those people, and there, there's some people out there in Kinkland who are this way. You know, there's the person you yeah. have a relationship with, and there's relationship sex, and they like it, and it's good, and they and they need it in their lives. And then there are their kinks, and they prefer to do their kinks with people that they have a different kind of connection to. And, and well, so and some people can't been, marry those things, and that puts the relationship you're in at risk, kind of, if you disclose. But besides that, other than that, and I think that's a small risk. Yeah, that's just my bigger worry. I meet a lot of guys that um, either they're into kinky sex and they don't want anything to do relationship side or um, anything but sex, or you meet the vanilla guys who don't want anything. So it's been one or the other. Mm -hmm. um, I just, I like you said, I'm nervous if I tell him this, then it's going to be like, we don't have that nice relationship anymore. We have the kinky relationship. But, it's one or the other. But the thing, <laughs> in the, you know, introducing into evidence, uh, he said early when in the relationship that you're in now, when you guys are first getting your vanilla roll on, that he did have kinks and that, you know, he had a, like a wild side. So he's almost, it's almost mm -hmm. like he's one of those people who's like kinky, knows he's kinky, assumes you're vanilla, just like you assumed he's vanilla, uh, <laughs> and is letting you know that kink cards are coming. He's going to lay his kink cards on the table at some point. But right now he's proving to you that he's good at vanilla and he likes vanilla. So once the kink cards are on the table and you're doing kink too, he's not going to neglect the vanilla sex that he assumes is your primary interest. And, okay. and so it doesn't sound like he's trying to keep these things 100% separated. You know, he's vanilling the shit out of you right now, but he like put down a marker that said, you know, at some point I'm going to want to kink the shit out of you too, or instead, or in addition. So okay. I, I think the risk of him being one of those, you know, Madonna whore came up on an earlier call, one of those Madonna <laughs> whore types, but for kink, and they're out there, uh, yeah. where, you know, vanilla sex is for the person you love and kink is for somebody that you care about as a partner perhaps, or you have a more distant connection to so that you can just fully live in the kink roles and not, you know, have to shift from arguing about bills or the rent or the, you know, the grind of daily life to like dom sub roles. Some people can't do that. They can't make that leap. Um, but it sounds like he isn't one of those people who can't make that leap because he already told you in the context of your vanilla kink or your vanilla relationship, your vanilla kink in the context of your vanilla shit that you're doing right now that, you know, kink cards are coming. Okay. So a message through Fat Life wouldn't be weird, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> you know, if you were going to do the message through Fat Life, I would do it if you were both sitting side by side. Uh, if we were okay. both, both of you sitting side by side on your laptops in the living room uh, for right. a moment, message him then so that he can like. I just, it's been hard to bring up. It's not, it's like, hey, you ever heard that song? Funny story. Um, <laughs> <laughs> You know, I'm going to make you an uh, offer. Profile. <laughs> I'm going to make you an offer. If you can't do it, you give me his phone number and I will do it for you. <laughs> that nice girl you've been I, dating who you think is vanilla, you might want to look up her <laughs> FetLife profile because you win Yahtzee. Oh, my gosh. Okay. I'm just, I'll spill the beans. And, and uh, thank you so much for calling me because I've been just like anxious to, to know what to do about it. You spill the beans. You have to make me a promise. Yes. We get a call back letting us know how it went. Oh, my gosh. Yes. Hopefully it's um, tears of joy. <laughs> <laughs> Give us a call back. Everyone wants to know how the, this Pina Colada song ends. Okay. Thank you so much for calling me, Dan. Bye. Would you buy a T-shirt for 50 bucks if you knew it only cost 7 bucks to make? Uh, hell no. And with Everlane, you never overpay for quality clothes. Everlane only makes premium essentials using the finest materials without traditional markups. They want you to know what you've been paying for and why, so they tell you their real costs. And they are radically transparent about every step in their process, from the materials they use to the ethical factories they work with. Everlane's clothes look better, cost less, and last longer. And because because Everlane sells directly to you, their prices are 30 to 50% lower than traditional retailers. Essentials like their Cotton Crew t-shirt are exactly what they should be. Simple, stylish, and made from quality materials. Men should check out their Quality Cotton Basics, premium Japanese denim, the perfectly fit Oxford shirts, and outerwear made from recycled water bottles. Nancy loves this. Recycle those water bottles, people. Make gorgeous clothes out of them, of course. Nancy also loves their shoes. So right now you can check out our personalized collection at everlane.com slash savage. Plus you'll get free shipping on your first order. That's everlane.com slash savage. Everlane.com slash savage. Hi, Dan. 
we've always raised our 17-year-old daughter to be a sexually independent young woman. Up until recently, she went to an all-girls school and avoided boys. That changed when our younger 14-year-old son invited his 14-year-old friend over for a sleepover several weeks ago. I should say that our daughter looks very young for her age, and this boy looks quite old and developed and comes off as very mature. They started flirting, which became romantic and recently became sexual. Our daughter now wants to go on the pill. We've looked the other way when the boy comes over for sleepovers, supposedly to hang out with my son. Because of their age difference, they feel awkward about being in public together and really won't do anything outside the house. One issue is that the boy's mom is a devout Christian and would be completely opposed and horrified if she knew her son was having sex. I should note that in our state, they are both above the age of consent and close enough in age where my daughter is not at legal risk. If we tell the boy's mother that her son is having sex with our daughter, she will definitely put a stop to the relationship. We're left feeling torn about whether we should say something to his mom who is allowing him to stay at our home under false pretenses. What should we do? Should we say something? Please help us think this through. So your daughter's a youngish 17. Your son's 14-year-old friend is a mature 14. And the age of consent laws where you live allow for your 17-year-old daughter and this 14-year-old boy to have sex consensually. There's no statutory rape going on here. There's perhaps a Romeo and Juliet law in your state that allows for older teenagers to sleep with younger teenagers, perhaps... The age of consent where you live is 14, as it is in several states. So nothing illegal is happening here. The the ethical dilemma is if this boy's mom knew, and do you have a responsibility to run to this boy's mom and inform her? And is that an out for you? If you and your wife are uncomfortable with what's going on under your roof, this boy coming over under the pretense of hanging out with your son when he's actually coming over to fuck your daughter— You need to take responsibility for that. Instead of outsourcing the shutting down of this to this boy's crazy religious mother, you should shut it down yourselves if it makes you uncomfortable. Doesn't sound like it makes you uncomfortable. Then there's the issue of your daughter who is sexually active and 17, even if she's a youngish appearing 17, she is 17 and sexually active. She needs to be on birth control, a long-lasting form of birth control, irrespective of who her partner is or how you feel about that partner or the age of that partner or who that partner's crazy bitch mother is. Get your daughter on birth control. It is sort of the Scandinavian, Dutch-Danish thing to allow for teenagers to have sex with their partners in mom and dad's house under mom and dad's roof because teenagers are going to be sexually active, many of them. And if they have to sneak around, then there aren't adults, not in the room, but not adults present, not adults easily available to them. If there is an issue around condom break, if there's an issue around the need for emergency birth control, if there's an issue around pressure or consent or violence, better that that should happen where there are adults who can swiftly intervene or be turned to in a crisis for advice and support. It is a problem for a lot of sexually active young people that they can't turn to the adults in their lives, that they turn to when they had a cold, that they turn to when they had a broken bone, that they turn to when they had an issue with their homework or a conflict with a peer at school that was non-sexual, and they suddenly can't turn to those adults in their lives when they have issues about the sex, the consensual sex that they are having because they fear being judged, they fear being shamed, they fear being dragged to a church and screamed at by a pastor, or they fear, in the cases of a lot of queer kids, being thrown out of the house and made homeless. So it is a good thing that these two sexually active young people who are not breaking any laws, who are not doing anything wrong, have the safety and security and comfort of being sexual in this controlled environment with adults they can turn to in case of a crisis. And if I were in your shoes, if I were the parent here, I would allow for this. I would accommodate this. I would perhaps suggest that the pretense end, that if he's coming over to see my daughter, that he doesn't have to pretend he's coming over to hang out with my son and that I'm not a fucking idiot. And they don't have to treat me like one. They also don't have to run interference. They also don't have to lie because I'm not a crazy conservative Christian who's going to blow up in a rage. Speaking of crazy conservative Christian parents, again here at the end, I don't think you should turn this kid into his mother. 
even at 14, 15, 16, an adolescent has a right to some zone of sexual autonomy, some zone of privacy. And if his mother isn't rational about sex and sounds like she's not, don't rat him out to her. Allow for him to have this freedom, this autonomy, this privacy in your home, the kind of freedom, autonomy, and privacy he doesn't get in his home. Make it safer for him by getting your daughter on birth control, safer for your daughter by getting your daughter on birth control. And you should have a face-to-face to him where you tell him you know what's going on and that you love your daughter very much and you expect him to treat her respectfully and to be kind and decent and you will hold him accountable if he's not. If you close your eyes and think about your sheets for a minute, are you getting mental images of silky, dreamy, sexy feelings, or are you suffering a jab of anxiety because your sheets are getting a little worn and ratty and and maybe even a little crunchy because you don't have enough sheets? You don't own enough sheets to rotate them? Well, you can solve your sheet problems this instant with Bull and Branch. Everything Bull and Branch makes, from bedding to blankets, is made from 100% pure organic cotton, which means they start out super soft and they get even softer over time. You buy directly from them, so you're essentially paying wholesale prices. Luxury sheets can cost up to $1,000 in the store, but Bull and Branch sheets are only a couple of hundred bucks. Everyone who tries Bull and Branch sheets loves them. That's why they have thousands of five-star reviews. And Bull and Branch only uses sustainable and responsible methods of sourcing and manufacturing. They also donate a portion of every sale to a charity to help fight human trafficking while preserving fair prices for consumers. And new sheets are arguably the best gift imaginable. Wouldn't you want someone you sleep with to give you new beautiful sheets? So do it for them before they do it for you. You're running out of time. Shipping is free and you can try them for 30 nights. And if you don't love them, you can send them back for a refund. But you know what? I doubt you're going to want to send them back. Still, there's no risk. Therefore, no reason not to give Bowl and Branch a try. To get you started right now, my listeners get 50 bucks off their first set of sheets at Bowl and branch.com when you use the promo code savage that's b-o-l-l and branch.com promo code savage bowlandbranch.com promo code savage hi dan i'm 44 year old trans woman although that's not actually germane to the discussion i kicked a friend out of my life a couple of years ago because she was she was just generally an asshole but she did a lot of like kind of passive aggressive abusive behavior to people and I think the thing that most bugged uh, me and my partner was that she had, uh, she was poly, she had two boyfriends that lived with her, and she treated them both horribly. She berated them all the time. When she wasn't berating them, she was passive aggressively mean. We just kept getting, I just kept seeing looks in the eyes of her boyfriends that, I mean, I had a, an abusive childhood, and I remember looks on the faces of the face of my mother that I'm not seeing on these two grown men. Uh, anyway, this was a few years ago, but she was especially kind of just belittling and infantilizing to uh, one of them. And uh, we just couldn't deal with it anymore. So we kicked her out of our lives. I, I told her off. Anyway, a few years later, I talked to an ex-girlfriend of the uh, one of her boyfriends, the one that I said gets picked on the most. And uh, she tells me, and I know she shouldn't have told me this. This is actually part of my moral quandary. But she tells me that his kink is public humiliation, which kind of changed the, it really flipped the script on me at that point. It really changed the context of it. And my, my question is, by her being cruel to him in front of us all the time, was she like forcing us without our consent to participate in their kink? I can't, you know, I can't say anything about it, obviously, because I'm not supposed to know about it. And I don't speak to these people anymore anyway. But it it started to bother me when I heard that because it was just like, wow, were we innocent bystanders in a BDSM scene? It's possible that you were innocent bystanders in a BDSM scene. It's possible that you were involved in a BDSM role play scenario without your knowledge or consent. It seems likelier, it seems more probable that this guy has a public humiliation kink and your old ex-friend that you cut out of your life is an asshole and that these things were concurrent. And when your friend was being uh, abusive and when your friend was being 
monstrous to this person. It wasn't uh, the public humiliation scene. It was just your friend's an asshole and monstrous. And coincidentally enough, he has a public humiliation kink because, you know, people who have the public humiliation kink thing, it's usually highly stylized. It's usually very much a, a, a ritual uh, with certain marks that are hit that, that, that turn them on. Just like in vanilla sex, usually there's a lot of marks that people hit that turn them on and there's a, a script and there's a, there's a structure and there's a framework. And that would have been apparent uh, over time if your friends had been going through motions around public uh, erotic humiliation. And that's not what you witnessed. It wasn't like your friend was ordering her boyfriend to to get on his knees or she was degrading him in some way that was clearly erotic. Your friend was just being shitty. And that's not how public humiliation kink works in the same way that beating into BDSM, being into impact player sensation play isn't the same thing as just being punched in the fucking face. And it is possible for someone to have a relationship where their kinks are indulged, their desire for a certain kind of degradation, a certain kind of ritualized erotic humiliation, that that's being that need is being met and also that person who's meeting that need in an erotic context for them and privately, publicly in front of other people is just revealing themselves to be an asshole who's generally not very good to their partners. And that seems the likelier scenario here. This person has this kink, maybe in private, it was indulged in public, your friend who in private was capable of indulging this person's kink in public, your friend was just an asshole. And these phenomena are not mutually exclusive. So all that said, these people are out of your lives. They're not going to confront anyone. So this is entirely hypothetical. You ask at the end what my position is on consent and involving people in your kink. I think that you shouldn't involve anyone in your kinks without their consent. With the footnote, of course, that there are some secret thrills that people can derive that involve other people who have no awareness of what is going on. And that is okay. I've written a lot about the secret thrill and the legitimate secret thrill versus the illegitimate secret thrill. Uh, and if anyone's interested in looking that up, uh, it's a quick Google search away. Hi, Dan. Uh, cisgender 29-year-old male here. I'm having a disagreement with my girlfriend that I'm hoping you can solve. Uh, we're in an open relationship and like to talk to each other about who we're currently interested in. Recently, I moved and had to find a new doctor to get a prescription filled. I randomly picked one that was near me, and it turns out that she's approximately my age, and I'm very attracted to her. After joking to my girlfriend that there's no way that I could ever get a date with my doctor, she said that I should ask her out. I'm of the opinion that it's not possible to ask someone in this setting out on a date without being a creepy, weird guy. My girlfriend says that if I tell her I'm finding a new doctor first, I could ask her to get a drink, and uh, it'd be okay. So, Dan, can you settle with this for us? Uh, which one of us is right? So, basically, your line here is, I want to fuck you, you're fired. I just began to see you as a patient. I'm attracted to you. I want to ask you out. I am no longer going to see you as a patient. I don't think that's going to be a successful strategy. Someone who is a doctor, someone, they're not bartenders. I'm not saying doctors are bartenders, but somebody who has to interact with the, the public the way you, your physician has to see his clients, sees patients, and is attractive is going to be on the receiving end of a certain amount of sexual, romantic attention. People are going to hit on this person. This person probably wanted to make you feel at ease, wanted to make you comfortable. The odds that she is attracted to you, I think, are pretty slim. You know, the odds that any one person is attracted to any other one person are always pretty slim. I'm not disparaging you in any way. But just because you're attracted to her doesn't follow that she's attracted to you. Even if she was open and affable and friendly and smiley, she's your doctor. She wanted to put you at ease. And perhaps she has an affable and smiley demeanor. Not all doctors do. Maybe she does. And a little dickful thinking kicked in and you're telling yourself that she might be up for it. If you weren't her patient, can you hit on her? You're not in a position of power over her. I suppose you could ask her out. It might screw up your relationship, your doctor patient relationship. You might not be comfortable seeing you in that capacity anymore, particularly if you're coming in for unnecessary prostate exams at a weekly clip. And you might then have to go see a different doctor. 
There's a whole other layer here in that you already have a girlfriend. If you ask her out, she may assume that you are single and available because that is the default assumption. And then you have to mention that you have a girlfriend. It's not just that you have to establish that she would date a patient. You also have to then establish that she is open to dating someone who currently has a partner. That she's not just a doc, but she's a poly doc. Seems like a lot of hurdles to clear. I would, if I were you, operate on the assumption that she wasn't interested in me and that I already have a girlfriend and so I don't need to chase my doctor and keep seeing her as a patient. And if there's a spark there, maybe after a few more visits, you could ask her out. You could lead with, if the answer is no, please say no. If this screws up our doctor-patient relationship, I will go find a, a new doctor and I apologize, but I've been sensing and maybe I'm crazy yeah, you're consenting adults and she has no power over you and you have no power over her. And I believe that consenting adults should be able to ask other consenting adults out on dates. But the odds I think are longer here than your dickful thinking may have led you to believe that they are. Hey, Dan, um, I'm a 19 year old pansexual non-binary person from the Midwest. Last night I had a dream where I was fucking my brother <laughs> And I don't really know if that's concerning or bad. I do have a, like, incest fetish, but never has it been that I actually want to do anything with my family. It's just, it kind of turns me on. I also have a little fetish. I enjoy calling my partner's daddy. I like when they own me. I like to act younger than I am. I wonder if that all kind of ties together and if I should be worried that I had this dream about my brother who I'm in no way sexually attracted to. I would never do anything like that with him. But I had this dream and it was, I woke up in the morning and I was like, ah, what do you think about that? Is that normal? Do other people that have fetishes similar to mine I've had these dreams. I am very confused and just want to make sure I am not, I don't know. Apophenia, the human tendency to seek patterns or to perceive patterns in random information. You don't want to fuck your brother. You had this dream about fucking your brother and you didn't wake up with any desire to actually go fuck your brother. You're also into daddy stuff and you have an incest fetish that isn't related to actually wanting to fuck any family members, which is what most people who view incest porn report. Most say that they have no desire to sleep with their actual family members, but there's something about incest porn scenarios, many of which involved stepbrothers, stepsisters, stepmothers, stepsons, uh, that turns them on. And it's the transgressive nature of it. It's the taboo violation. But in their fantasies, most people with incest fetishes, in their fantasies, they cast strangers in these roles, strangers to them, imagined fantasy scenario, family members, but not actual family members. So what's likelier that you had a random dream, a random sex dream, and your brother got pulled into it somehow because no one really understands how dreams work or what they mean or what the fuck is going on. I had a dream once about fucking the Queen of England. And I am a monarchist. Are those two things related? I don't think so. It was just a random fucking dream. And I was having sex with a woman who happened to be the Queen of England. Weird. I also watched The Crown. I binged The Crown all week long. Maybe I wanted to fuck Claire Foy for five seconds, but I doubt it. It was just random. It doesn't mean I'm secretly heterosexual that I had a dream about Elizabeth Windsor. And just like I don't really want to have sex with women or the Queen of England, I don't think your dream means that you secretly on some subconscious level, because dreams are not a key to our subconscious minds or desires that you want to have sex with your actual brother. Seems to me that it is far likelier, so much more likely that I'm just going to say this is what it is. You have these certain sexual interests, you have these kinks, you have these fantasies, and you had a rando sex dream that your brother got pulled into. And it's not, these two phenomena are not related. One does not implicate the other, and neither implicates you. 
All right, before we get to your response calls, some of your tweets. Kristen Page tweets, I demand Dr. Jen Gunter go on the Savage Lovecast with Fake Dan Savage, and I'm going to drink this G&T until it happens. Enjoy the G&Ts, but it's already happened. The great Dr. Jen Gunter has been a guest on the Savage Lovecast in the past. Dig through the archives. She's also been a guest expert in Savage Love, my advice column. Look her up and pre-order her coming new book, The Vagina Bible. I have got my copy pre-ordered. Get your copy pre-ordered right now. Just Juno tweets at Fake Dan Savage. Is there any non-phone way for people outside the U.S. to ask a question for the Savage Lovecast? International calls are expensive, yo. Yes, of course, you can record a question on your own phone or on your own computer, and you can email it to us at voicemail at savagelovecast.com. Dave Nicholson tweets, I live in an old folks home and we play Yahtzee now and then. Good to know that somebody out there is playing Yahtzee and gets my incessant and constant Yahtzee references down there at the old folks home. Thanks for writing, Dave. And finally, Philip Harkin tweets, new Magnum subscriber. Really love it. Thank you for everything you do. I'm a pretty sex positive person and don't want to sex shame anyone. What are your thoughts, Dan, on Roger Stone's cuckold online persona? Hashtag Savage Lovecast. Well, Roger Stone, who's been in the news, if you don't know who he is, Google him. Conservative, longtime activist, self-confessed, self-admitted, self-described, self-identified rat fucker. Apparently, he and his wife had ads in Swingers magazines in the 70s and 80s and 90s where they were seeking thirds. And he was framed or described or was implied strongly that Roger was a cuckold. Is there anything wrong with that? No, of course, there is nothing wrong with that. But Roger, of course, has been aligned with a political party for decades that seeks to persecute other people for their private consensual sexual conduct. So if Roger's online doing dirty things kind of dirty things that got him bounced from the Bob Dole for president campaign way, way, way back when that opens him up to charges of hypocrisy. And that's where people get outed. That's where people's private consensual conduct becomes fit for public debate when it is evidence of hypocrisy. If you are carrying water for the Republican Party, if you're a Republican activist and you behave in not family values ways when your pants are off, We all have a right to discuss that. Thanks for all your tweets. If you want me to possibly read your tweet on a future episode of the Savage Lovecast, be sure to use the hashtag Savage Lovecast. And now, some response calls. Hi, Dan and the Savage Lovecast. I was calling regarding your uh, most recent episode about the woman who called about her friend uh, forcing her partner to uh, get circumcised. I completely agree with Dan 100%. Uh, if the genders would have been swapped, um, this would have been so horrible, and you would have thought that your friend was a monster, and she is. So maybe don't be her friend anymore. And for the people that were wondering, on second place penis are amazing. My partner has the most amazing penis I've ever seen, and I can't believe that people would just want to change that. Also, if you're not doing it for religious reasons, maybe don't do it. It's not that big of a deal, and you don't really need it, man. Out there, don't get circumcised for your girlfriend that you know that for sure you're not going to be 100% with them. Anyways, enjoy your uncircumcised dicks. Hi, Dan. This is about your most recent episode and the poly woman who is, like, cheating with all of her friends or helping her friends cheat. I am livid. This is the kind of behavior that makes people really wary of poly i'm poly myself and when i come out some people like shrink from me because they think i'm they think i'm there to get their man it's really infuriating and if i was as a woman's wife i would leave her in a minute because she's helping with this behavior and also if someone's cheating then they're less likely to tell you their std status or practice safe sex like she's really putting a lot of people in jeopardy and she's just being a bitch like She's not a good person. Hi, Dan. I'm calling about the guy in episode 641 who went to Vegas and hooked up with a sex worker and is now considering using sex workers regularly because he can't find a girlfriend. Um, You told him that his beauty standards are probably unreasonably high, and I agree, but you missed the bigger picture, which is that this guy sounds insufferable. Um, I guarantee you his main problem is that he's annoying women with his arrogance. Uh, For example, the way he made it sound like he was doing the sex worker a favor by fucking her. Um, No, dude, she's just doing her job, you know. Um, And he has no idea if she really came, by the way. Um, And then he's congratulating himself, you know, for treating her with the basic 
decency you should afford anyone you're having sex with, regardless of whether they're um, you're paying them or not. And and Bizetti keeps going on about how kind and generous and sweet he is. And kind and generous and sweet people don't go on about how kind, generous, and sweet they are, right? They just they just live it. It's like show don't tell, you know. <laughs> If this is the way he's pitching himself to women, you know, when he goes on dates or he meets them in bars, I guarantee the problem is that they're turned off and they think he's full of it. The stuff about, you know, how hard his dick is, it's just like, you don't have to say it, man. Just like have a hard dick. Like, good for you. As most guys do. Just you don't have to like make a thing out of it. And then, oh, then the way he introduces himself as a feminist, like he seems like he wants a cookie for that. All of it is just weird, man. So just like get your life, you know, but it's not women's problem. It's, it's you're being weird. And we're going to leave it there. 206-302-2064 is the number here at the Savage Lovecast. If you'd like to record a question or a comment for a future show, give us a buzz. 206 206- 302-2064. My Dirty Little Film Festival Hump is out there on the road, headed to a city near you. For tickets and more info, head over to humpfilmfest.com. Follow me on Twitter at Fake Dan Savage. The Savage Love Cast is produced every week by Nancy Hartunian and me and the tech savvy at Risk Youth and Nancy. We'll all be back at you next week with an installment of the Savage Love Cast. Thanks for downloading. <laughs>